Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play team. This actual play uses the 5th edition Vampire the Masquerade tabletop role-playing rules by World of Darkness. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. Listeners should know that this podcast is intended for a mature audience and will include strong language and mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and so forth, that may bear resemblance to entities living, dead, or undead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Rena Henze, and for tonight's game, I will be your storyteller. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Old Ways Podcast, Vampire the Masquerade Chronicles, Shards of San Francisco. I am your storyteller, Storyteller Rena, and tonight we all have a party to go to. But before that, I'd like to thank all of our listeners and all of our Patreon backers for all of your support. We quite literally could not do this without you. If you would like to join our Patreon and support us there, you can do so at patreon.com slash the Old Ways Podcast. And now we need to get to a party. So... Let's have some introductions. To my right. Hi, this is Mike. I am played Marcus Voss from Clan Bruja, and we finally had a goddamn union meeting. You did. A very surprising one. See how that turns out for you. And next to Mike. Hi, this is John. I'm playing Sylvester Love Willett. I am your local clan gangrel representative. And I have to have a shower and go to a party, but I sleep underground in a park. So. This is a change of pace. It'll be fine. You'll do great. Yeah. I'll use conditioner and everything. Wow. Fancy. And next to John, we have... Hi, this is Tegan, and I'm playing Rom the Shaman of Clan Marxism. Oh, shit. I mean Malkavian. Wonderful. Uh, Sees the brains of production. And at the end of the table... Hi, this is Ali, and I play Katerina Bogdanovich of Clan Toreador, and... I have someone to break. Yes, you have a nice new vending machine installed in your office. And next to Allie, we have... Hello, hello. My name is Bridget, and I am playing Monica West of Clan Salubri. She has no idea what she's doing with her life right now. Do any of us, really? Who knows? And normally, I would say last but not least, but again, not tonight. So instead, I'll say next to Bridget, we have... This is Tiffany, and I play Alex Giovanni of Clan Hakata. Wonderful. And last, but never least, we once again have a delightful guest star with us. Hello, my name is Patrick McNamara of Dog Food Studios, your best friend and the only person who truly understands you. Uh, And I will be playing Roger Pendley Font of Clan Malkavian. He's having a wonderful time. He is indeed, after stirring up a lot of controversy. At Elysium. So we are now embarking upon a new night in San Francisco after all the controversy at Elysium the night before, but also some agreements that were reached with a, well, an interesting election to come. So before we get into the events of tonight, why don't we have a rouse check from everyone as you wake up? Sir Roger is fine. I have an eight. Sylvester has a seven. Nine. Well, you did have a very tasty snack the night before, Katerina, so that makes sense. Yeah, Monica failed big time. Okay, so Monica, maybe it's because of all the excitement of the night before, but also Annalise did take a double helping of your Vitae, so you didn't really have time to eat, and you're stressed and anxious, and yeah, it makes sense that you wake up hungry tonight. And Rom the Shaman is also a bit peckish. Again, it makes sense. Alex is also a bit hungry tonight. There's a lot of change in the air. And, you know, you still haven't been able to talk to Mina with everything going on. And Luther's been absent a lot. And it's it's just been a bit of chaos. And we know that Alex Giovanni does not like chaos. So three of our vampires have woken up a bit peckish this evening. In the case of Rom, more than a bit peckish. But uh, 
Well, even with last night being as exciting as it was, Monica, it's still party night. You don't have time to relax, really, because the thing is, you already so carefully made all of those hand-written invitations for Marcus and Katerina and Alex and everyone, and you've spent so much time setting all of this up, and you got a note from Sir Roger saying that he'd be coming, and, well, it would be a shame to have to, to postpone it, so, well, you're having a party tonight. I can only imagine that she's probably sitting at home right now trying to figure out how she can send a mass cancellation to everyone. And then seeing that confirmation from Roger and going like, well, God, fine. (laughs) But we're going forward. Hey, I know this is more retroactively, but this is just something that Monica would have insisted on. This is such a bad decision, but Monica's really good about making really poor decisions. Can she bring Annalise home with them? So you brought Annalise home over the very, very askance look of Chase the night before. But it's just that sort of look from his third eye saying, we'll talk about this later. I don't want to have an argument in front of the children sort of thing. Oh, yeah. And her response is that third eye won't even make eye contact with his third eye because they know better. So, yeah, this is going to be let's bring this child home. This is such a bad decision. And then we're going to follow that up with she had a set schedule for everything that needed to happen today. She needed to be here by this time. She needed to help the ghoul set up by this time, launch time. with But all of that is getting bumped back by like three hours because now she actually has to go out and buy a dress for this little brat too. So there's that that's going to happen as soon as she wakes up. Yeah, it's it's a bit complicated. Annalise just kind of curled up in a dark corner in the library, which is also Chase's office, and went to sleep clutching her doll. She was perhaps a bit overfed last night. She is still a child. Her brain is still eight years old, which you you haven't really met vampire children before. It's rather taboo in most kindred society. So it's hard to reconcile perhaps the vampire is 400 years old, but she's still mentally a child thing. But she curls up and goes to sleep and falls asleep almost immediately. And then when she wakes up, since you have her, I'm going to give her a rouse check too. She's fine. After her double helping last night, she just looks around and goes, where am I? This isn't home. Nope, it's sure not. We need to go shopping. Come on, let's go. Shopping? I never get to go shopping. Mom says I scare people. Oh God, Rena, you are breaking my heart with this kid. This is the worst decision ever. You're placating this character. (laughs) I hate you. I'm the worst, I know. Mom's, mom used to say I have an aura of unsettlingness, so she wouldn't let me go out. Well, at least your mom was transparent. Come on, let's go. And she'll follow you out, looking around, yawning a bit. Chase comes out of your bedroom and looks down at the kid, looks back at you, gives you this, are you sure? Really? Kind of look. And she is going to respond in tomorrow. No, I already know it's a bad decision, but that's a it's a poor decision that we can unpack later. I'm going to go get her something to wear. I'll see you at the venue. All right. If, if you insist, we do have updated numbers. I'm going to check in on the ghouls, make sure everyone's set up for the evening. And he furrows his brow and all three eyes look at Annalise and she just sort of smiles winningly at him like a kid who knows that they've done something wrong but are trying to cute their way out of it and monica hates to admit it it is really cute she's gonna spin her on her shoulders and push her out the door you go out the the cats are out eating and you can take annalise out shopping yeah i mean this is in and out listen find a cute cocktail dress for an eight-year-old and let's rock out Yeah, you you find something pretty quickly, although Annalise just keeps stopping to look at things. You get the feeling she wasn't let out of the house much when her mother was alive. But I am going to make a roll for something. Don't eat the sales associate. You see a five-year-old holding his mom's hand, and he turns and he looks at Annalise. And he looks at his mom and he looks back at Annalise. And he bursts into tears and starts crying. 
Monica is going to take note of that. She doesn't understand it, but that's something it looks like she's going to need to learn very, very quickly. Okay. Okay. So you find uh, an eight-year-old appropriate dress for Annalise. It's got a lot of frills and ruffles, which she she seems very excited by. But she is also looking out at the street as you as you drive away from the store, and she just says in this voice that is older than her voice has been before, just says, it all feels wrong. It's just been me and mom for 400 years. What do I do now? I think it all feels wrong because it is all wrong. And I don't even know how to begin to fix it. But we can't go backwards. We have to go forwards, right? She's going to throw her right hand, you know, over the center dash at her. She takes her hand. She looks at the wrist. Don't. Dot. Don't. Don't. Sorry. Those big puppy eyes again. Monica rolls her eyes and keeps driving. <laughs> All right. So as Monica is helping Annalise get ready for the party and Chase is making sure everything is set up, what are Marcus and Katarina up to? I've had quite a night. I'll probably find a better place maybe for the head when I uh, get home. I'll have to think up some place to put it. Or perhaps I'll have it shaved into sort of a, a better shape because it's a, a block. It doesn't really, it doesn't feel like a real trophy. Maybe I'll get one of those, you know, those holders that they have for yards outside where the colorful spheres, you know, mm-hmm. like from the sixties or whatever, those lawn ornaments. Maybe I'll get something like that. And then I'll, I'll shape it into a bowling ball shape. I have a, a weird fascination that I could make it into a bowling ball. Either way, I, I think when, when he wakes up, he is likely going to get ready to go to a party and hope that some things have changed. But also, he would probably check in with uh, Esmeralda and sort of get a pulse of the city at large post Mallet. So you call in Esmeralda and she looks a little bit more relaxed this evening than she normally does. She's not quite as on high alert as she's had to be ever since November. But she comes in with her cap pulled down over her eyes and just says, Well, Ventru ain't happy, but are they ever? But uh, I keep an eye on Curtis and his boys. They're really pissed. You should have seen their faces. Oh, I wish I hadn't been distracted by making sure that Elysium was actually as secure as Sebastian keeps telling me it is. But I heard it. Yeah, they're not done. It's not over yet for them. And that's okay. Maybe the hunters will get them first. That is what I'm more concerned about. Mm. So mostly what I'm getting from people around town, everyone I've talked to so far, and I had a chat with Gene a few minutes ago, things seem a bit calmer other than the Ventry boys. But Tremere seemed to be pretty quiet. I think that whole... Their whip was a Nazi thing might be getting them to shut up just a bit. And the thing that I saw inside of Elysium was just that. Yes. Oh, little news for you. The Nosferatu Mm. are back. Really? Quietly. Yes. More than uh, just M? I saw them. Saw M at the meeting last night. There's more than a handful at this point. And that's actually a really good sign. One of the worst things a city can have happen to it is having the Nosferatu leave. Mm. And so that it's actually a, a really good positive point. Part of the churn of the information churn that happens in a city doesn't happen without the Nosferatu. And we may begin hearing things that we didn't before because people are going to begin talking. And that's good, too. We want them to. Okay, that's good to know. I thought it might have been just M coming back. Good to know they brought their friends. I can talk to M. Okay, great. Uh, there is a um, a soiree this evening. I'm aware. You were invited, weren't you? Mm-hmm. You'll be attending. Okay. I kind of broke her nose last time. Yeah, I I get the feeling that Monica loves you, though. If vampires could blush, Esmeralda would be blushing more from confusion than anything else. 
I don't understand that one. I really don't. Listen, love is blind. We all know that. When, when you say love is blind, Esmeralda's eyes just get really big and really confused, and she just sort of stammers out up to, uh, gotta go. Gotta do things. There may be dancing. You may want to stretch the glutes and the hamstrings and whatnot just to get ready, get loose. I snicker. Uh... I'm going to put on something fantastic, and I'm going to try for once in the past several months to have a good time. I suggest you do the same. You just hear Esmeralda mutter, Madre de Dios, as she turns around and flees, literally flees out the door. Oh, I tell you, it's this effect I have on people. I turn around. And Jean's there waiting. Jean's in a fancier looking jacket and jeans this evening. She says, um, I know we're trying not to do a lot of business tonight, but the shaman's here. He said he needed to talk to you about something. In private? In private, yes, but, um, yes, that'll be fine. Do you want me to stick around? I'm sure by private he just meant away from kindred at large. You presume to understand what Rom means? Fascinating. Well, we have to try, don't we? I'm certain that there are many, many shadows in any room in the house. Oh, yes. This one in particular. Very full of shadows. There you go. Private. And you go into your meeting room off to the the side where you meet with people away from the main gathering area. And there is Rom. Rom, Captain, how are you? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. And how are you, uh, Count Councilman? I've, you know what? That's a fantastic segue because, and as you can see, I, I have uh, uh, my notebook uh, here. Um, I did want to talk to you about scheduling a couple of different discussions about how uh, process and procedure would work um, within the uh, the union area. You know, we have a lot of terms we need to define, such as what are we going to call the area? What are we going to call the, the group? What kind of positions we might need um, in order to support this? Uh, what the process might be for conducting a blood hunt or, say, uh, requesting uh, uh, the, the, the ability to produce, um, you, you know, your own uh, vampire yourself and, and, and sire. Uh, all of these things are very important questions that we should, um, at some point, take a meeting to lay out. Hmm. All right. That seems fair. We'd probably want the other council people i don't know what we want to call ourselves at this point we do want to kind of stay away from feudal terms i'd say it is really nice to see people finally catch up to um at least 1917 um at the very least uh, socially in in this cadre um but yeah uh you know i just you're just curious what would uh, your opinion be because uh, inquiring minds have been asking um, what uh, if there was to be a process for something such as uh, creating uh, more vampires because you know we've had actually a drop in in the population of, of vampires in San Francisco and and there has been concern. I've heard in the network about the ratio of kindred to kind anyways. And I was just, I'm, I'm just pinging you because there were some people who wanted some input on that process. And so, um, Mom, you want a baby shit. Um, uh, I do, I do. I need, uh, I, I, I'm looking for some help and some assistance with some tasks that I I have been conducting. And I will, once there is a proper process that has been outlined, be petitioning for that said privilege. Yes. Would you like to hear a story? You know what? Yeah. You you're all yeah. Yeah, go go for it. For the better part of five decades the right of progeny was kept from me mm -hmm. by our former prince. Mm. 
they chose to keep that right for me when I wanted to make a vampire. And mm. f- first they did so saying that it was for my betterment, for my protection, that mm. I didn't have what it took to be um, making children. And since I was within their domain, that was perfectly within their purview to do so. Of course, Esme is gone. They're no longer prince. And the subsequent princes after them have sort of not worked out either. Um, But I respect that every kindred may want to at some point pass on their knowledge and expand their own family tree, as it were. I think that we are in some ways burdened with the knowledge of what happens in making a vampire. And I would just say that the proper way to do it before any sort of princedom would be to look to your elders and seek guidance. And so it's perhaps suspicious that we've been able to have Sir Roger around. And as he is someone who is longer lived within Clan Malkavian and was at one point its whip, may still technically be, although I don't know if that's the case. Perhaps if you're coming to the party tonight, I know that Sir Roger is invited. Perhaps the two of you could talk about it there and then he can give me his insight. I I don't have any particular desire to even be the person you would have to ask for permission. But that said, it, I'm thankful that you came to me because one thing that will trip off the hunting crowd quicker than anything is a bunch of new vampires running around causing trouble. Absolutely. I completely agree with everything you said. And I wanted you to know that you have my, if if not my empathy, my sympathy for the situation that you were in in the past. I'm going to take your advice. Um, and I want you to know that I appreciate that you have noticed that I am attempting to go through proper channels in this process. So thank you for your time. And as always, you have my cell phone number. You don't use Discord. You know, we might be useful to set up a Slack for the council. Uh, Just, you know what? I'll I'll, I'll, I'll set up some options for you all. Um, My goal is just to be, you know, a bit of a knowledge manager for you know, for the three of you and make sure that you, you can all obtain the resources that you need. You have a fantastic day and I will see you at the party later. <laughs> Thanks. Zip out of that, out of that space. Gotta, uh, gotta, gotta not be in that room now. Yeah. Rom leaves and the Bruja on the, at the, at the door, you still gotta have security at the door around here. Let's him out and Gene melts out of the wall and just says, well, that was interesting. And uh, upstairs, Katerina, do you have any thing you're doing? I don't know. Is she awake? You can make her awake. Did she say conscious after she drank from me? She did. And she you could see her fighting to stay awake for a while. And you had to go to bed before the sun came up. She is unconscious when you wake up. Okay, so I'm going to go have a snack. Do I need the snack? No. Am I going to have the snack? Yes. I'm going to let her wake up with unfiltered uh, pain. I'm not going to worry about sugarcoating it for her. I'm a vampire. So I will let her wake up naturally to uh, fangs in her neck. While she's still chained to my chair. She wakes up. As she feels your fangs touch her throat and she tries to pull back almost instinctively and she can't because she's chained to a chair and she's let let me go. What is wrong with you people? I did nothing to you. Oh, but you did. You endangered everything and everyone that I love and hold dear. Did my job. Yes, and now your job has landed you here. And I will relish in your misery. And I'll full-on bite her this time. And you sink your fangs in, and she lets out a little yelp, 
but she can't fight it. And you do have that sort of natural anesthetic. And she goes a bit limp as you feed, but you can still hear her muttering in French very rapidly until she passes out again. So across town, Sir Roger, how are you preparing for this event? You weren't sure if you were going or not to Monica's reopening party, even though it was very kind of her to send you a personalized handwritten invitation. But after last night, well, seems like it wouldn't be a bad idea. So Roger's been uh, taking a, an evening uh, constitutional stroll. And he's now slightly worried um, because he uh, stopped off at a outside a store called Dr. Need's uh, House of Weed, which he assumed was uh, some kind of nursery where one buys, one buys botanicals of all kinds. And he's feeling a little bit peckish, so he... Uh, he did feed on a on a on a customer coming out of uh, of the store, a man called Graham, and he's starting to feel slightly the worse for wear, and he's starting to worry that he may have inadvertently pre-gamed uh, the party. He's wandering along and he's thinking about this, and he's thinking for the first time in his entire existence how nice it would be to have a packet of Cheetos. Well aware, of course, that he's incapable of eating such a thing. But nonetheless, that that hunger is upon him, and it, it's a very it's a hunger that comes from a different part of his soul, to the the hunger for blood that uh, ignites his very existence. And Sir Roger isn't even exactly sure what Cheetos are; he just knows that he needs them. Yes, there is certainly a, there there is a hole in his life where uh, a che- which only a Cheeto could possibly fill. Um, so he's he's making a, a constitutional stroll on his way to the party, but starting to feel rather the worse for wear. So Sir Roger is wandering around the streets of San Francisco, headed more or less down towards the docks, trying to find a packet of Cheetos. Not exactly sure what this is, but it is a great quest that he must fulfill. So he goes into a he goes into a, a, a news establishment of some kind. And he says, excuse me, um, uh, very much kind sir. Uh, do you have, uh, well, do you sell snack foods here? Yeah, dude. Yeah. What, well, I mean, what would you recommend, um, for someone who may have inadvertently, you understand, possibly ingested a kind of cannabinoid? The young man's eyes just kind of light up. He goes, oh man, it's your first trip. It's great. You never forget your first trip. Okay, man, I gotcha. I gotcha. And he comes out from behind the cashier's desk and takes you over to the snacks aisle, which is just long long rows of chips and all sorts of things. He says, okay, you're going to want flaming Hot Cheetos. I know it sounds wrong. But it's really the best thing you can get on a trip, man, because it just, it lights you up inside. And he hands you a bag of flaming Hot Cheetos. Now you're going to want the sour cream and onion Funyuns. Best ones. Other people say they'd prefer the ranch, but I tell you, sour cream and onion's where it's at. And he hands you a bag of those, mm-hmm. and he just starts piling bags of chips into your arms and says, that ought to do you for your first trip. You might want to start keeping things on hand if you're going to make this, uh, a regular thing, but... I see, I see. Um, now, um, I confess uh, that uh, I have a, a further ask of you. Uh, I will give you... Um, here's what I would like to happen. is your, I would like you to eat all of these snacks, and I will pay you um, 2,000 uh, US dollars in cash. It's not... It's not an... It's not a type of intercourse thing. He looks very confused. Have you ever seen $2,000 in person? It's quite a rush. And he just gets a, a wad of bills out of his out of his coat. Okay, man. It's it's like a weird way to get your munchies on, but okay. He just Indeed. starts eating all of the chips. Okay, and I, I, uh, I wait very patiently for him to... Uh, can conclude the eating of his chips and then I with great grace 
and respect for his boundaries um, feed upon him so that I may enjoy the sustenance that he is partaken of. Cinematically, we see this young, blonde, probably surfer kind of guy just eating all of these chips and he's telling you about which ones are his favorites and why these are the best and uh, what you want to keep on hand when you need need to f- get a fix and, and all of this. And he finishes up the last of the chips. He's licking his fingers, looking a little sick from all the chips he's just ingested. And then we just see Sir Roger kind of pounce. He th- Roger thinks he's being very dignified but Sir Roger is also high. So he kind of pounces and we just see almost slow motion as he sinks his fangs into the guy's neck and the guy goes, whoa, man, I did it. And then the natural anesthetic in your feeding sets in. He just goes, oh man, this is a great trip. They're never going to believe me at the YMCA. So I take it as... as uh, uh, just a small amount, just enough to, enough to be satisfied, because uh, this is it, truly this is a munchy experience rather than a ravenous hunger. Well, I think I think I'm going to need a willpower roll here, Sir Roger, because you're high. I, I suspect it <laughs> to see to see uh, how how much of the munchies you have, and if just a bite is going to satisfy you. Um, I got one success. It, one success is enough. It, it's enough to not drain him. Okay. But if you keep it at one success, he's going to be fairly anemic and it's going to be fairly obvious that something happened to him. Okay, I'm just going to burn a a, a point of willpower. Okay. Reroll some dice. Okay, so I got a crit, so I got four successes. Fantastic. Okay, so you can feel yourself that the taste is somehow intoxicating. This strange, hot, spicy, sour cream, onion weird salty blend but it it kind of shakes you out of the high a little bit and you're able to stop and close the wound and leave him blissfully passed out surrounded by empty snack bags and two thousand dollars in cash i do look into his eyes uh before he passes out and say forget to remove his memory of this event probably a good idea if only you could do that to cameras so Sir, Sir Roger tells the clerk to forget and then goes about uh, making sure the one working camera in the store is no longer the one working camera in the store. Meanwhile, Sylvester. What up? Mariam has made it very clear that she expects your attendance at this event. Yep, she sure has. And this mm-hmm. Olivia person was involved, and it's a big deal for her, and I have no idea who the fuck that is. But I gotta be here for Olivia to support a member of the clan. Again, I have never met Olivia in my life. So. Mariam has also suggested that you might want to clean things up a little bit. And by things, she means you. Yeah, yeah, she does. Well, the handy thing about being a weird hobo in San Francisco is you see all sorts of people. It's a real mixing pot of social strata and income levels and prey. And, um, you know, I've got to live my best life and eat prey kill. Fortunately, I've, for this occasion, got a gentleman lined up. He works in Silicon Valley. He's a tech bro, but he wears decent clothes. Now, he's about my size. And to be honest, I think there's going to be very little problem with a little bit of larceny and then a home invasion going slightly awry. Oh, no, no, nothing can possibly go wrong there. No. In fact, it's kind of routine at this point. So mm. it, it's just normal for you. So, so, so Sylvester takes a shower in someone else's shower, wears mm-hmm. someone else's clothes. They fit pretty well, although they're slightly baggy in some places, but you know, it works for you. And you've done a little digging, quite literally, in some points, getting some information on Olive. That's right. That's what her name was. That's pretty close. Yeah, close enough. I mean, yeah. same name, more or less, right? Yeah. And you get some some notes from one of your operative cells that you've started scattering around San Francisco. Olive's a bit of a loner. 
but she's very good friends with Mariam. But she's more of a loner than Gangrel tends to be. Mm -hmm. Actually, she sounds a bit like how you do things. Yeah, I can respect that. She disappears for long stretches of time and then pops back up again. Some of us just... It speaks to our soul. Mm Mm-hmm. But no one else really seems to know much about Olive, other than that she has a lot of connections around town. Mm -hmm. And that she seems to know people in multiple municipal planning offices, which has been very helpful for some things, including getting a park expanded instead of more townhomes built around it. There's a bit of admiration from your colleagues when you hear this, but ultimately it boils down to if you really want to know anything about Olive, you either need to ask Olive or you need to try to get Mariam to talk to you about it. Yeah, Mariam won't tell me shit. So yeah, I've broken into a guy's home. Made it look like a botched burglary. Yeah, I've put my hair up. It's I'm looking kind of smart. I've exfoliated my skin using whatever it is he has here. I've uh, then bleached the hell out of the drains. Again, this is all standard procedure as far as I'm concerned. I will take some beer from his fridge and um, I will take some money from his bedside table. Yeah, I'm just going to take some stuff for the road. So Sylvester has everything set up the way he does it. It'll be fine. Nothing ever comes of these little burglaries. Mm -mm. And he prowls off into the dark, headed to the party. Alex, how are you preparing for this event? You had an interesting night last night. I'm going to get dressed for the occasion. So I'm going to put on purple velour suit with a black silk shirt and a black ascot with a large purple amethyst and make sure that I am set to go. And then I have to stop by and see Eddie and Louis and pick up a donation. So I'm not too terribly hungry. And yeah, probably head out to the party. So Eddie is just hanging out with Loki, the cat. He's chilling this evening. It's one of his nights off where he just wants to get high and watch a lot of really terrible D horror movies. But he his donations in the fridge. It has a note saying taken before I took the weed. And you go down the hall to see Luz and they open the, the door for you and they their eyes are bright and kind of excited behind their glasses. And they've got another snake different from the last one that you saw draped around their neck this time. uh, So I I found something on on that woman you wanted me to look for. Uh, Oh, Kate? Kate Markovich? Was that? Yeah, that was was the name. Uh, So it has taken me, oh my god, so much work. I don't know how she hides herself so well, but good lord. Come on, come on. Did you find where she's at? I'm not sure if she's still there, but I think she's in Sacramento. Oh, that's not too terribly far. No, it it took me a while to find her there. Or at least I think she's still there. I mean, see a picture of the same woman that Luz had shown you before from the sort of 1940s style picture, except now it looks a bit more modern. Same long hair, pulled up. She's wearing a, a darker suit and her face is blurry, like turned away from the camera as if the photographer caught her unawares and she was trying to dodge it. But at a city council meeting in Sacramento, working on expanding, uh, expanding funding for the local library, she's going under a different name now. But I had I tracked her all the way to New York, and then she went all the way out to Ukraine. She was in Kiev for a while. I found a picture of her there. This is from two years ago. It's the most recent one I have so far, but it's close. Do we have a phone number? Uh, I've got the phone number for the library she was at the hearing for. She was talking about expanding one particular section of the library for something. What name is she going by now? Old books. Um, she, she's going by Dana, Dana Rosenthal. Okay. I will have Lila see if she can get in touch with her. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I hope she's still there. I don't, I don't know if she is, but, oh man, that was a great puzzle. Oh, I haven't had a puzzle that complicated in years. Well, I'm sure I'll have some more for you, but thank you. I appreciate all of your work. Yeah, just, just. I hope she's. I hope you get to talk to her or find her or whatever it is you're looking for. But wow, like she's got this kind of, or they've got this kind of. Uh, light in their eyes like they seem buzzed but not in a chemical or uh, alcohol kind of way just really high on success at the moment I'll uh, pick up my donation and uh, look back at them and tell them when I come up with another one you'll be the first one to uh, have a crack at it awesome and you hear them talking to the snake around their neck as they wheel back into the back part of the apartment. See, I told you, Curly, it would work out great. Yeah, if we just keep at it. Yeah, I'm just talking to the snake as you close the door. Then, yeah, then I'll give Lila a call and have her get a hold of, or tell her about the library, tell her to see if she can track down any way to contact Dana Rosenthal. Uh, I'll get right on it. Have fun at your party tonight. I should hopefully have something for you by tomorrow. And if you can just um, stop by Mina's and let, well, and feed the cats and then also let her know that we're closer to finding Kate. I'll leave her a note. Thank you. And so all of our kindred are now on their way to this event, the soiree. Marcus, you drive over there with Katarina and you just see Esmeralda skulking. Ooh, skulking. She's got her hands in her pockets and she's moving very slowly as if someone is forcing her to walk in a direction she does not want to be walking in, but she is headed in that direction. Well, that's even better because I have a present for her. Like, do you stop her on the road or do you, are you going to give it to her when you get to the event? No, I'm just going to uh, shortly for a small amount of time disentangle myself from Marcus's arm and go over next to Esmeralda. I believe that our host intended you to have this as well. And I will <laughs> give Esmeralda the package. Oh no, not another one. It is not from me. It is from her. And I'll just put the package in her hands and go back to Marcus. Loop my arm through his. Away we go. You two go into the new Makai Gardens, leaving Esmeralda standing outside holding this package. And Sylvester, you start, you're walking up towards this event and you see Esmeralda standing there staring at a wrapped box in her hand, looking confused. What you there, bud? I don't know. It doesn't move. It doesn't smell like anything. He like <laughs> crouches down, sniffs, and he's like, eh, no, you're right. I don't know. Open it. She gingerly pulls apart the packaging. And uh, Bridget, what does she find inside? So this is a what had happened moment with Monica. <laughs> there is a Toreador jeweler that she is absolutely obsessed with. It's where she orders all of Chase's jewelry, her own jewelry from. What she told the jeweler was, hey, can you get me like a small trinket size um, medallion or trinket that looks like the galaxy thing that was hanging off of the cat's collar in Men in Black? The Art Artillian galaxy thing? I want that. And that's like the picture that she sent him. She wanted something like that. But this Toreador is very literal. So what he did is made exactly that. So that's literally what it is, is that little Arterian galaxy wrapped in silver with the internal looking like a galaxy with light moving in and out and stars and things of that nature. So this is what you also see, Sylvester. Esmeralda is just staring at it like she's afraid it's going to bite her. Oh. And he looks up at her and looks her in the eye and he's like, so you going to wear it? Or is it, is it something you wear? I, <laughs> he kind of looks at me and he's like, I am a little, it's like a cat's neck ornament or something. What do I do with this? Why, why is she giving me presents, Sylvester? What does she want? My experience might be sex. 
Esmeralda's eyes just get so big. It looks like it's going, they, they look like they're going to cover her entire face. <laughs> hmm. You just like, well, could be that. Could be. She's a weirdo and just loves giving people presents. Or it's a weird flex showing how much money she got. That can't, can't have been cheap. <laughs> he just looks at her. He's like, I have no fucking idea. If you want it, you could wear it. But I, uh, I wouldn't, but it's not. He kind of looks at me, he looks at her and he's like, no offense, Esme, but uh, it's not really your kind of. She looks a little bemused and you and you see her looking in the windows where you can see Monica just sort of moving around, talking to people. And she looks back at it and she's like, Sylvester, how do I people? Wait, why am I asking you? <laughs> well, what does that mean? <laughs> As always. My main experience is to ignore what they think. Fuck them. You can beat the shit out of them. And um, if th something goes really, really bad, you can fuck off into the woods for 10 years and come back and everything's probably fine. I did that. I came back to all of this mess. Hmm. But then she leans in and she grabs the front of your shirt and pulls you in very close and says, if you whisper a word of this to anyone, you will not be sure how many ribs you have anymore because I will shatter them. <laughs> uh, and he's just like, I ain't telling anyone, bud. Your secret's safe with me. We've been through enough that I'm not gonna hang you out. Not for this. I don't even know what this is, Sylvester. Is it a bracelet or is it a necklace? Is it like a cat's collar? I, I don't I don't know. I'm afraid to ask. Is it a keychain? I don't have keys. Awkwardly puts it in her pocket. And Sylvester puts a hand in his pocket. He's like, oh, wait, no. Yes, I do. Whoops. <laughs> These. Oh, whoops. And he just puts them back. And he's like, I'll get rid of those later. And you two head into the party. Esmeralda doing her very best to reassemble her composure on her face. It's not going super well. You can tell she's mm -hmm. very baffled and confused. As her, like, best friend, I am going to do my best to get her centered. I'm just going to be like, look, you're, you're not, you're not, you're not doing the thing. You got to center on something. So, food. And the two of you go in search of food. And mm -hmm. <laughs> this is when Sir Roger pulls up <laughs> in his nice car with his driver. Although... You had to call your driver to come get you, Sir Roger, and you're not exactly sure how you got to where your driver picked you up from. It's not a part of town you normally go to. You still have the faint tang of something orange and chemical in your mouth. Well, uh, I do. I was certainly aware that I was not in a condition to drive. So I called my driver and he came to pick me up. And uh, I've, now, I've now arrived at the party. Um, who do I who do I see in front of me? Who's still outside? So you see Rom the shaman ambling up. Rom doesn't really drive anywhere. More of an ambler. Yes, especially because it's all in the territory. So, Rom, uh, pleasure to make your acquaintance again as always. H how does this uh, How does this day find you? Oh, it finds me very well. I'm quite satisfied with uh, the arrangement you all came to last night. Indeed. The uh, the first San Francisco Vampires Union. I mean, it'll certainly be unique. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the wider world's reaction will be to that. The, the kindred world, of course. But I did want to talk to you if you had a chance sometime during this party. Of course, Rob. Is this something we could talk about now, or does it require a specially prepared location? It does not require a specially prepared location at all. I was talking with Marcus, and he gave me some very good advice. And that advice was essentially that I need to talk to you. The topic is um, siring. A oh, I see. New vampire in this town. Particularly um, myself, siring a vampire in this town. 
And as someone who is older in the blood and in this particular clan, um, I wanted to see if you would support my uh, petition within this council, within this group, and within this territory um, to do so. I have... A, a number of very responsible and resourceful ghouls that I think would make excellent candidates, uh, one of them. And I'm not just doing this out of some um, vain desire, but I, I intend to have a purpose uh, for this individual. There is, of course, a lot of work to be done, and we have lost so many of our kindred in this city in recent years. And so my initial conversation with you would just be to skim the top of your mind for your thoughts on the subject. Well, Ram, it is not impossible that I would support uh, any claim you would make to uh, procreate I wouldn't say it's necessarily likely. I would perhaps need to hear more. And in, indeed, we haven't yet decided upon what the rules are and how such a thing will be determined. Now, we certainly, I would suspect that the union, uh, it's safe to say, would not want people to be uh, siren children, children willy nilly. Of course, of course. I would hear your case. Ram, if it even comes to that, if I'm even a figure, even a figure of relevance in this discussion, then we would hear of it. I would question the wisdom, perhaps, of taking a devoted attendant and transforming them through the power of the blood into a rival. May I ask why? Uh, because they might eventually try and kill you, Ram. That's what rivals do. You would be creating for yourself a very close personal relationship with someone who is suddenly struggling with extreme anger management issues and potential resentment at your stealing them from the glorious light of day. So it would be in your opinion that the better course of action would be to choose someone with qualities that I admired, but that I hadn't yet identified and made a ghoul. Well, they say that before you sigh a childer, Ram, you should dig five graves. One for yourself, one for your new child, and then three for the amount of attendants who you're going to try and replace them with who sort of don't work out for whatever reason. It's a, it's a question of uh, chipping away at your logistical foundations, Ram. Now, I believe that kindred have the right to make their own decisions uh, within limits. So as I said, I would hear your case, but I would advise you as, uh, as an elder in the clan to think about what it is you truly want to achieve by uh, ushering one of your attendants into the endless night. Well, I know what I want to achieve. I, you know, of my particular proclivities and opinions when it comes to symbiosis between vampire kind and humankind. I simply want to have someone that I can raise within that philosophy and can continue to help me in my aid and aid me in taking care of the kind of the city. I mean, what would be better than to create another vampire in this town whose goals would align with taking care of the kind instead of some other vain aspiration or pursuit? It, wouldn't it be better for the society to create someone with that particular goal already in their heart before it stops? Well, Ram, I confess it's been a rather long time uh, since I've been a father. Are you familiar with the common complaint 
of parents that their plans to create a new person who would do exactly what they were told, follow after them in every way, and just generally be well behaved. A lot of parents complain that that can be uh, rather restrictive, that their children can indeed be too obedient and hew too closely to the ambitions of the parent. Are you prepared for that eventuality, Ram? I am with compassion and listening and radical honesty. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I understand the risks as they have been explained to me by my sire and and has been additionally stated by you and Marcus. But I've... <laughs> I have a good feeling about this. I've done a lot of work maintaining a sizable base of ghouls. I'm fairly decent middle manager. I feel like I could guide a new kindred member of the society to a useful and good place. Well, I confess, Ron, that I was deploying a kind of advanced irony and that rather more of a problem for parenthood is that they don't do anything you, you fucking tell them, Ron. They want to do the opposite of what you tell them. They want to make you unhappy. That is That is how children thrive. They thrive by draining the souls of their parents. I just... <clears throat> I'm not saying you shouldn't be a parent, Rob. That's not my decision to make. But think carefully about it. Because there has been... In every part of this case you have made, there have been serious holes in your, uh, perhaps, expectations. The other question that I would bring to mind is what will all of your other ghouls think when one of them is raised above the rest? Food for thought, Ra. But we will see what the arrangements are before the council. Or if indeed there is a council, such a thing has not yet been decided. But we'll find out what the arrangements are. Certainly I'm not telling you, no, Ram, I don't believe that that's my place. But I, I suppose in a way, if you are God in this discussion, then I am advocating for the, for the part of the devil himself and trying to find flaws in your plan. However, I will confess that I have found some. So, worth thinking about, Ram, certainly. Then all I can say is that I appreciate your time and I will be here to assist in facilitating all of the policy that this uh, presumed council um, is planning on making. And I will do my best to assist you in that process. Well, I feel like that's something we should shake hands on, Rom. Do you agree? I do. And yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and shake Roger's hand. So Roger shakes your hand warmly and smiles and then enters the party. So, Alex, you come rolling up in the Lincoln just in time to see Sir Roger and Rom shaking hands about something and then Sir Roger walking into the party. Yeah, I'm I'm just going to go about my business. Alex! Or not. You look really good. Holy shit. I know. And thank you. All right. Hey, do you want to... Um, you seen Jane? I saw her last night. Well, yeah, I know. I was there. Like, we were in the same chair. We were in the same booth. Did they call... I'm I'm the Malkavian. Why can't you not remember things? I saw her after that, but... Oh. Like, you know, like, did she say nice things about me? You, you can ask her. Is there something going on? Like, I don't want to get in the middle of that. That's that's not my thing. No, nah, there's like there's not a middle. There's there's no middle. It's good. We're all good. I'm good. How are you? You don't seem good, but that's okay. Yeah, I'm I'm hungry. It's okay. I assume that there will be things to eat at the party, so I didn't really do anything about it before I showed up. Oh yeah. I almost forgot. Yeah, she's 
got flavors. Like, legit, like, flavors. We're talking about the party. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. I didn't know if we were still talking about Jane. All right. Fantastic. She has flavors? I wouldn't know. Anyways, let's go into the party. (laughs) So with that awkward conversation, (laughs) you go inside. Monica, you've been moving around with Annalise sometimes in tow, looking at everyone and creeping a lot of people out. Sometimes she's just sitting in a chair in the corner. Again, creeping people out, but there's not really anything you can do about that. I mean, she's creeping me out, too. Let's be super honest about it. It's true. So everyone you've invited has come in now. You see Jane sitting off in a corner with her double jointed legs propped up on a stool. And she's got a wry sort of smile on her face as she's just watching everyone. But everyone has arrived on your guest list. So why don't you describe this scene for us, this this party that you've prepared for the kindred? Yeah, thank God for Olive from Clan Gangrel for being able to get all of this organized. But basically what she did was took over an abandoned Chinese buffet. So you have the long hallway that you come in where you were normally would be like checked in, but all of that's been knocked down. And there's this massive, massive, massive open space that's half living botanical garden where you can walk in and out of rows and just disappear or get time alone or have private conversations. Um, There's also a small boutique store that's on the inside where you can buy, you know, seeds and, you know, different things to help with startup gardens. She does have a string quartet playing right now. Um, The floor Listen, contractors move as quickly as contractors can move. It's not perfect. It'd be something that she'll have completely redone sometime next week, but it's at least enough where there's a um, separate dance floor where people can dance if they want to. But the one thing that she did uh, as soon as she ran in the door um, with this poor child in tow was like, get her and chasing this child into a room and rapidly get dressed because this pushed her behind her schedule and she wasn't ready. But just before they went into her office to get dressed, she would have asked one of her ghouls to change all of the ambient mood lighting to purple. Originally, it was lime green. That's all those like LED lights that spring from the floor behind plants that like throw colors on the wall. As soon as she came, it was like, purple, I need everything changed to purple. Purple, now, please, thank you, sorry. Uh, and getting dressed. Now that the hysteria is over, she's dressed, the child is dressed, she's mostly awkwardly making rounds, saying hello to people, greeting people, being really humbled and impressed with the turnout. She is wearing a black satin romper uh, that has like the high collar that almost looks like a choker and her back is completely out. Uh, That's being complemented with black pumps. She has her hair pulled back into a ponytail because, again, she didn't really have a whole lot of time to get dressed. But it's probably the most dressed up anybody this table has ever seen her because she's usually in some form of like jeans or sweatpants. And ghouls are walking around with menu cards. They all have different colored wristbands that are associated with a menu card you would have received upon entry that tells you which ghoul is flavored as to which flavor. It's quite an interesting party atmosphere. It's definitely different from Rom's party. Yeah, no orgies at this party. No no orgies yet at this party. (laughs) The night is young. (laughs) It is. The night is very young. And uh, Katarina, as you come in with Marcus... A young human comes up to you discreetly and just tugs on your sleeve and says, oh, excuse me, uh, Miss Bogdanovich? Yes? Uh, Monica asked me to, to give you this in case you need to escape somewhere at some point during the night if, if you get overwhelmed or something. And they hand you a small key. It's, it's for the office down, down the hallway that way. Uh, third door on your left. If you just need to decompress for a bit. Understood. Where is our hostess? Oh, she's over there. And he, uh, they point off to a corner where you can see Monica talking to a group of the ghouls who are putting on their armbands. And where is Chase? Uh, Chase? Oh, Chase had to go check on something from the music. Oh, there he is. He's coming out of his office right now. And you see Chase coming out of one of the doors down the hallway in a very neat dark gray suit. And he's wearing a, a white shirt with a teal tie that he's adjusting. 
as he comes out into the main room. Perfect. I'm going to squeeze Marcus's arm and just like abandon him to go talk to Chase. <laughs> bye bye. I'm going to um, go hunting. It is a party. I'm sure, there are people here that can um, fit the bill. Yep. Do you find a couple of the more athletic looking ghouls? They've got a red wristband with a silver key on it and that according to your menu indicates that they are of the more athletic type for those who prefer to have a little run before their meals I'll uh, I'll see you know seek out those with that same armband if it's just this one or if there are more take a look see what's see what's around also of course we'll want to as well look for the host and you you find a couple of these ghouls wearing these armbands. There's three of them scattered throughout the room. Esmeralda's already got her eye on one of them. She seems to be stalking him, but he seems to be aware, but pretending that he doesn't know that she's stalking him. Esmeralda also seemed a little bit on edge now, which she wasn't earlier. But you see Monica coming out of the, the corner where she was talking to her ghouls. She's making polite conversation, talking to people. And Chase is now having a conversation with Katerina. Cool. So Marcus is going off hunting with one of the ghouls who apparently is on the track and field team at his university. So it's going to be a fun, fun hunt for Marcus, I think. Absolutely. What are the rest of you doing as you, as you come in? Sylvester Esmeralda's started stalking one of the I'm here for the hunt ghouls, according to the menu. Hmm, yeah. Play hunting isn't something Sylvester can enjoy. He knows that it's set up. It's not the same. He's tried. There have been parties before. It just doesn't work. He's like, okay, leave those off. What the hell else is on this menu? Why would you have flavors of blood? It's weird. Real weird. Bum, 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 bum. And he just like looks around. <laughs> And to him, he's looking around totally innocuously, but to everyone else, it's just like he's sizing up anyone with a wristband. <laughs> well, you do feel a little bit more comfortable in here than you thought you would, Sylvester, because there's so many plants everywhere, mm. and there's all this glass letting in the, the moonlight and the starlight. You can see outside really easily, so it's not you know two little windows and walls surrounding you, and just everything feels alive. There's also a koi pond, so you've got babbling water and fish. So hmm. it, it's a little more comfortable than you were expecting it to be. Yeah, I was expecting a normal vampire party, which is usually loud, bad music and uh, a lot of leather for some weird reason. Yeah, no, he's he's like, oh, this is actually kind of nice. Yeah, no, oh. no, oh, it's, it's like the old days when you just had a party and you could talk to somebody. It was nice. Then the 90s came and ruined everything. <laughs> He was in the woods for the 80s, so he doesn't know that it actually started way earlier. But yeah, he's just going to... At first, he's going to stop and just enjoy the plants. But he's like, no, no, I've got to... I've got to show my face to one person in particular. So uh, he is off to track down Olive. And if this means asking, hey, do you know Olive? That's what it's going to take. So it takes you a few minutes wandering around... And then you see Monica talking to this tall, lanky looking woman with very, very reserved sort of air around her. She's also got a personal bubble you could see from space. Everyone except Monica seems to just automatically give her a certain range of space around her, not getting too close. And she's wearing dark green, a dark green suit. Her eyes glint kind of amber in the light. And you think this is Olive. Monica, what are you and Olive talking about as Sylvester comes up? Probably next round of contract work that needs to come in. She probably shouldn't be working, but she is just going, things that she's noticing is like, okay, so that wall that we put up, it's not that it didn't do a good job, but we should probably move. It's one of those things when she sees Sylvester come up and she smiles. I wasn't expecting to see you here. Thank you for coming. 
oh, well, I never turned down an invitation. And he smiles far too widely. <laughs> I was invited, so I came. Mariam sends her regards. She hopes you have a lovely evening and that the new location works out very well for you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And you, and she's about to say out loud, oh, you actually showered. She's on that trap, on that path, and she kind of dials herself back. Do you look, do you look charming this evening? Thank you. I, uh, I made a bit of an effort. I figured you deserve it. Hey, I appreciate the effort. Just for the record, if you ever come back, um, you can come as you are. I appreciate the effort. I really do. But just, you don't have to make the effort to come here. Kind of pauses and you just like, it's a normal smile. It's, it's not the, ah, predator smile. It's just, just a smile. (laughs) Which doesn't usually happen. He's like, all right, well, that's good. Yeah, I want to talk to you about some stuff later on, if you don't mind. Uh, Look, I don't want to ruin your night, but it is stuff that I think you probably want to know about. Uh, You know what I mean, bud? It's not a big deal, but I would rather we talk about it than not. Okay. Not super high priority, but for right now, enjoy your night. (laughs) And he turns to the woman in green and he's like, I presume from the color of your clothes, you're olive. That's very perceptive of you. And Monica will spin out of that conversation. I appreciate you giving me the clue. Mariam sends her utmost regards. Uh, I don't have any particular message for you, just that she hopes you're keeping well and that uh, I am here as her envoy if you have any messages for her. That's what the pigeons are for. See, that's, that's what I keep telling her, but apparently needs someone on the ground. Or in it. We all sleep where we're most comfortable. Yes. And for some of us, that's, well, a little darker, a little smellier. But that's fine. <laughs> he's just like looking up at her as she talks to him. And he's just like, hmm. She's very tall. Yeah. And I'm not very tall either. So that it's doubly neck craning. Mm hmm. Just like, well, look, I, uh, you're a very hard person to find anything out about, but if there's anything I can do for you in the city, give me a shot. You know what I mean, bud? Why don't you give me a charisma and insight role here? I would love to. Would you? <laughs> I actually have charisma three, <laughs> but I only have insight <laughs> one. So we'll see how mm-hmm. we go. Okay. Two successes. Okay. With two successes... There's a little tingle in your brain, not the kind you get when you're around Malkavians too long, but just a feeling. Gangrel are known to the rest of vampire society as essentially the early warning system for your ability to feel when things are off. Mm -hmm. Something's slightly off with Olive. You're not sure what, but you feel something just, it's like a puzzle piece that isn't completely fitting in. There's just a little centimeter of space there. He's just looking at her and he's like, and it's very obvious to her that he is sizing her up and figuring things about her that he's just filling in gaps as he looks at her. And he's just like, you know, you and I are kind of unique-ish, not special, but, you know, uncommon. Most of the clan is more pack animalish and you and I seem to be fairly solitary. You know what I mean? Some predators prefer to hunt alone. Hmm. It's true. That's all. Very true. And you you would know, wouldn't you? Being what you are. You know what it's like. The jungle cat. On the prowl. I know about you, Sylvester. I know so many things. You might be an enigma to most. She gestures casually around the room. But I know you. Just keep that in mind. Enjoy your party. Yeah, all the act is dropped. He's just like, I hope you have a great time, Olive. I really do. If there's anything I can do for you when these hunters come around, let me know. Uh, Hunters. Little humans thinking they can out hunt 
us. What a delight. The only downside of dying for, uh, you know, at least half the day is that they have us at a disadvantage in one regard. So let's not get too egotistical. I would remind you that there's a reason we hide in the shadows and we have the masquerade, Olive. It's a, uh, it protects us. Do you see any masquerade breaches around here? I don't. I see a lot of vampires in one place. I see a lot of weirdos in one place. If I was a hunter, I'd absolutely firebomb the shit out of this glass house. And he's just going to walk away from her. You hear her laughing across the room. While that's going on, Katarina, you were having a conversation with Chase. Approach a little more cautiously, given the intensity of the last conversation that happened. Chase looks up as he adjusts his tie. Ah, Miss Bogdanovich, thank you for coming. Yes, would it be possible for me to get you and Monica for a sidebar at some point tonight? I'm sure that can be arranged. It does not have to be immediate. I just wish to apologize properly in person. Third eye sort of looks you up and down like it's calculating something. Very well. I'm sure it'll be appreciated. Perhaps towards the end of the night. Anytime. I will be here until the two of you are ready. And I will walk away because I don't want to impose on him because he is also the host so I know that he has duties to perform and everything of that nature as well you can feel him watching you just for a moment as you walk away like all three eyes and then he turns away and goes back to glad handing and speaking to people so Monica you see Alex come in and they are looking immaculate as usual she will peel herself away from what Ever conversation she's having with anyone to go and approach one something that absolutely immaculate. It's almost like she's being called by a dog whistle. You drift over to Alex. You can't help yourself. They're just so goddamn pretty. Yeah, it hurts. It really does. As Monica approaches, I will put my arm out for her as I walk to the most visible table here. Oh, she slides directly into place. That's easy work. You look stunning. Even more so than usual. Thank you. I tried. You feel all three of Chase's eyes on you from across the room, Monica? Yep, we'll go ahead and dodge those. That she's allowing herself to be escorted by them. I'm just going to go to the most visible table where everybody can see me and wait for people that want to talk to me because they do. Everyone wants to talk to you. Well, almost everyone. Alex and Katarina very intentionally do not look at each other. It's almost like a blind spot, a moving blind spot around the room. Oh, Alex, have you eaten? Uh, yes, I did. Thank you. I have something for you before you leave. Just make sure you touch in before you step out. Oh, I will. Thank you. Chase is watching you, Alex. You're not quite sure what the emotion is. He hides his feelings extremely well. Not quite what I'm referring to as resting Alex face, but (laughs) pretty close. (laughs) Just watching you as various kindred come in, come up to you, talk to you, move away. Some look at you and hide. He's always just watching you throughout this party. Every time you turn around, you can feel that third eye watching you from somewhere in the room. And Rom, you're wandering around the party, maybe having some good drinks, and you feel a little tug on your sleeve. Oh, I do? Okay. Yeah, what's causing this tug on my sleeve? There is a small blonde child staring up at you. Oh, shit. Hey, you're... Um, hey, how's it going? You... That is a very nice dress. Thank you. She does a little spin. You're welcome. How are you enjoying the party? It's a very nice party. You're a Malkavian. I am. You are observant. Yes. 
Also, it's the sailor pants. Ah, uh, yes. Well, these are my favorite pants. Is there anything I can do to make your night better? I want to talk to Sir Roger, but I don't think he wants to talk to me. That's... He didn't like my mom. Hmm. Would you like me to attempt to make an introduction? Yes, please. Okay. Why don't you wait right here and I will be right back. Your brain is like spaghetti. That is true of many people. I am one of those people. She nods and just holds her ball. I'm going to go find Roger. So uh, Roger is uh, is uh, looking at some of the refreshments, sort of standing with a glass of something in his hand, looking... Uh, He's looking slightly the worse for wear, but you'd, you'd have to know him pretty well to realize. Well, Roger, uh, sir, Mom? I, uh, I, you know, interestingly enough, you're about to have two conversations tonight about children. This one has nothing to do with me, but I appear to be a messenger here. Um, I wanted to let you know um, that the uh, uh, fortunately late Miss uh, Van Van Ness's children is at this party and is desiring of speaking with you. Now, they also seem to understand that you might not want to speak with them. So all I have done is made the conversation possible by coming and talking to you. If you don't desire to speak to them, um, I could uh, find a way of handling that situation gently. But I wanted to place that choice in your hands. Mom, did, did you ask uh, the spooky child why they wanted to talk to me? I did not. That uh, is very much something that my answer would be predicated upon. Well, I mean, if I go back now and I'm like, hey... The answer is maybe, but what do you want to talk about? Then they might not wait on me and just come over here. Do you? Would you like me to 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 ask that question? I could actually phrase it in the fact that you are maybe. about to move to another location or something. Make the introduction, Rob. Okay, fantastic. I am here to be helpful. All right, I'm gonna lead Roger over to uh, the, the 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 tiny the tiny evil child. Evil's a big assumption. I, I, well, I'm not gonna say tiny evil child. That is in my head. Annalise looks up at you, Sir Roger. She looks more composed than she did last night when you saw her feeding on Monica's wrist, and mm -hmm. she says, "I wanted to talk to you last night, but I was hungry. Sorry." Well, we've all been there. Uh, very nice to make your acquaintance. Mom had your book. Did she now? And Annalise nods. With the the plays and the poem? Could you be more specific? The one you wrote. In oh, I see. In 1573. That's quite a rare book. I know. It was in Mom's library. She said that you couldn't have it back, but if we're making a new city, maybe you should. Well, I would say that would be very much up to you. And she starts giggling and says, you didn't like Mr. Shakespeare very much. No, I confess that his sort of scrawled dawblings have never, never pleased me much. They always reminded me of uh, something that perhaps a baby might write on the walls of the shit museum. I think it's funny. We should talk about your book sometime. I read it. Oh, and uh, what did you think? But please, if you didn't like it, lie. She laughs. It's a surprisingly mature sound coming from this tiny eight-year-old. It was very interesting. I just want to make sure I'm going to be okay. I see. I know a lot of Camarilla don't like when... People make children, well, childer. 
but I want to be okay. I see. Let me ask you a question. As perhaps the oldest vampire in the room to perhaps the second oldest, do you find that uh, it's easier for you to survive if you act as though you're quite stupid? Because I do. People think I don't know things. I bet they do. I bet you know quite a lot, don't you? Maybe. I bet you know how to form how to form alliances. How to get people to look after you. Is that what I'm doing right now? I suspect it may be, yes. She smiles and pats your hand and says, We should talk, Sir Roger, sometime. I'm sure we will, but let me reassure you that the Union will care for the members of the Union. That's what we're for. I don't think most of your Union likes me. Well, that's the wonderful thing about the Union. They don't have to. But we will. We'll talk. Some point later. I would quite like to track down the host of this party if uh, if you're able to point me in that direction. Which one? Monica's over there and Chase is over there. Oh, I see. Well... I fear I'm going to have to leave this party rather early, so let me go and uh, pay my respects to the uh, to the host, and uh, okay. we will talk soon. We will. And she starts combing her doll's hair, just sitting there. So you go up to Monica to pay your respects and say your goodbyes. Mm-hmm. Monica, I I must apologize. I think I'm going to have to go home early, but I think you'll appreciate it if I explain to you the reason why. There's no explanation necessary, but I'm happy to hear it. I appreciate you for coming. You see, I was passing by uh, Dr. Need's House of Weeds, and um, I was under a misapprehension as to the purpose of this store. Um, It became apparent that it was a dispenser of cannabinoids. And I've... uh, I'm rather afraid that I I fed on someone shortly after they came out of the shop, and uh, this has caused my pregame to go into overtime. But I I do want you to know that I did bring a gift. I I received it from a a man at a convenience store. It's really rather good, and he brings out a sort of yellow packet. He says, "So it's a it's a type of onion um, made of fun." I I've discovered that uh, should you give this to a a, a mortal. Before you feed on them, you can indeed, to some degree, ingest into your very body the fun nature of these onions. And I've, I found it to be tremendous, and I've always thought that it's better to give the gift of an experience than an object. And I, I do hope you agree, and that I won't seem terribly rude for showing up for such a short time and presenting you with a bag of Funyuns. No, you've... You've attended when I didn't think you'd be able to make it, and for that much I appreciate it. And you're leaving a lesson behind. Apparently I need to elevate my gift giving to include experiences and not just objects. Well, uh, I'm glad I could be of some kind of service. And I, I hope I'll be able to talk to you very soon. You make your goodbyes, Sir Roger, and you start to turn to leave. It's started to rain outside. There's a bit of a thunderstorm rolling in and the rain is hitting the windows. It it plays very nicely with this live string quartet that Monica has set up. But as you turn towards the door, the door crashes open. And Mariam is standing there soaking wet. Her face looks grim. And she marches through the room. There's no other way to really describe it. Just water dripping everywhere, the door opening and closing in the wind. And she looks at you, Marcus, and she just says, Fuzzy's dead. And that is where we will leave tonight's episode. Thank you all for joining us at this very interesting party. Thank you again, Patrick, for giving us some fun and funions tonight. It was my very great pleasure. We will see you all next time. Thank you and good night.